Well, aloha and good morning to all of you tuning in here to the Honolulu Star Advertiser Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us here on the COVID-19 Care Conversation brought to you by the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. Uh, we are a, we, it is a weekly show where we sort of bring you the insights of things that are impacting our community right now, especially with COVID-19 and uh, happy to have all of you joining us once again this morning. Good morning. Yeah, everybody. we have a Good morning, Ryan. We have a very special guest today. Uh, the Hawaii State Teachers Association President Corey Rosenley is joining us to give us a teacher's perspective on what uh, coping with pandemic has been. You know, our schools are so critical to getting us uh, through this period and also getting us all back to work because a lot of parents can't work if their kids aren't in school. Uh, so we would love to hear from him about his perspective and we wanna know what your questions are. So please type those in the comments and we're gonna get to those in just a second. Um, some good news, we always start with the numbers. We have had uh, single digits now, Ryan, for the last 10 days. That's right, another great sign. Four new cases bringing the statewide total to 613 positive cases throughout the state since this pandemic started. Uh, of those new cases, three were actually Oahu adults. One was a Hawaii resident diagnosed outside of the state. Uh, and so yesterday was a pretty significant day, day where the governor says actually the curve has been flattened. We heard fl the curve was flattening, uh, but him saying, uh, the governor actually saying that the curve is flattened uh, completely. Right now, of course, there are still 16 deaths. No new deaths were reported yesterday. So uh, again, some good news with the announcement that the curve is flattening. And again, uh, one more day of that single digit total. Yeah, and because the curve is flattening, the governor also says that we will start to see some phased reopenings of certain businesses. That's kind of in line with Mayor Kirk Caldwell's announcement that he wants to open things uh, in limited ways before the full uh, order, stay-at-home order lifts or ends rather on May 31st. So we're talking about golf courses, um, things that can be automated in-person real estate appointments, but that's by appointment only. So things like that, we should start to see starting to open up and hopefully getting the local economy back up and running. Um, what's not opening anytime soon, as far as we understand, is the schools. And so to talk to us more about education is Corey Rosenley. He, of course, is the president of the Hawaii State Teachers Association, and we welcome him this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here. Let's start out with that first uh, sort of premise that we talked about, that we're seeing a lot about what um, this pandemic has been like for parents. You know, if you go to social media, you see all kinds of homeschooling uh, setups, people trying to accommodate distance learning. What has this experience been like for teachers? What are you hearing from your members? Our teachers have actually said to us that this is actually requiring them to do more work than even before. Um, it's just, we, since this, you know, whole crisis started so suddenly, you know, some of our teachers were not prepared to do distance learning. Um, and so now they have to reach out to students on an individual basis. They're having to prepare lessons and modify them for being online. And, you know, it's, it's a very different situation. When you're in class, there are a lot of sort of a bag of tricks that teachers have in order to motivate our students. And when it's online, it's, it's more difficult, but we're still trying to find a way to make sure that we can engage them and keep you know, our students interested in the material and helping them to learn. I would think that it would vary uh, by age group. Which teachers do you think, what, what sector is having the, the most challenges when it comes to actually incorporating distance learning? Well, I think the most difficulty that uh, I've heard back is definitely from our special education teachers. Special education is a challenge even in the classroom. Um, and now you have students that every student has their own individual need. And some of the times that just can't be met through distance learning. Um, and also having to make sure that we comply with the, you know, the requirements and trying to make sure that we document as much as possible. I know a lot of our special education teachers around the state are really stressed and they're doing the best they can, but this is a very difficult situation. You know, I know that the teachers are often waiting for, or are waiting for the, really the Department of Education to provide a little bit more context into what the next school year will look like. But there's a lot of people already asking, uh, what is it gonna look like? We already have a question here from Katie. Um, how will elementary schools manage social distancing? Not only elementary schools, but across the board. Has there been any indication or talk uh, amongst the teachers, suggestions of ways in which they could maybe implement this idea of social distancing within the classrooms? 
So there's two difficult situations when it comes to social distancing. And I can give you a secondary perspective when I heard from elementary students, teachers. Um, I've taught classes of 40 students. There's no way you can do social distancing. And then the concern is what happens at lunch or after school, uh, the intermingling of students as well. Um, there are discussions. I mean, I've seen some of the ideas of maybe potentially, you know, um, going every other day or limiting class sizes uh, and potentially even kids having to only eat in their own classrooms. Um, for elementary school, the hard part is, especially the early grades, those kids love to hug everyone. I mean, and they'll rub their noses and they want to give you a big hug after they did it. And trying, I mean, for any parent out there that's tried to manage one five-year-old, you know, try to imagine dealing with 15 or 25 of them. And it's just very hard to control their behavior. And of concerns, of course, that's exactly how the virus can spread. When the last time Dr. Kishimoto, Christina Kishimoto, the superintendent of the DOE was on, she said that they were proceeding with summer school plans as previously planned. Do you think that that's realistic? Do you foresee class being in session in any kind of way this summer? Well, I think that one of the questions was, would it be online? Um, and so would it be that kind of summer school that would be provided? Um, we have not heard anything about trying to bring students back into the physical classrooms yet. That is not a conversation that has occurred. Uh, we would still have a lot of concerns with that. Um, you know, it's good to see that there are cases going down, um, but I think all the research shows and the scientists show that it can very easily go back up again. I know a lot of our teachers wanna go back to work. They miss their students. You know, I am a parent. I have a junior that goes to Campbell High School. And I've heard her say, and what have a lot of her friends say, they actually miss school. And I want to record that and play that back to her going on in the future. But I think a lot of our kids miss the environment of school and the teachers miss them. We'd all like to get back. But the last thing we'd want to do is create an environment where you, I teach at Campbell High School. On a given day, there are 3,000 students on that campus in close proximity. And when the bells get, when the bells ring and kids are switching classes, there's just a mass of humanity uh, doing that. I mean, it's just the you know petri dish of what the virus would want in that case. So, you know, um, we have to be very careful that we create an environment that doesn't make the situation worse. If distance learning is here to stay, when you look at a population like Campbell High School, those 3,000 students, how many of them actually have the access that is required to do this in an effective way? So this is the, the concern that we have too. And I've had conversations with certain parents and they're like, I don't understand. My child's got a computer, we can help them. Why don't we just go online grading? Because don't forget, they are learning. It's just the grading is not there. Why can't we just do grading? And this is the, the message that we're trying to get out. What we've seen through some of the polling data is this, is that families that are wealthier, so schools that have less than 25% free and reduced lunch, about 75% of their students are participating. But when you get to schools that are 75% Title I, you have 25% of students participating. So for schools that have high poverty, they're less likely to have internet, less likely to have computers. They're less likely to have parents that can help or maybe even understand English. And so, we can't just say that my experience is what everyone's experiencing. And this is, you know, creating a greater divide in our schools that already exist because some of our kids are just going without right now. You know, you mentioned and, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. Finish. And just one thing to add on top, top of that right now. One of the things we want to be very cognizant of as teachers is when we see students come into our classrooms is they come in with all of the other problems and situations going on in their daily lives. There are families right now where, you know, one or two parents have lost their jobs. They're worried about food security. And the last thing we want is, you know, a parent having to yell at their child to try to get their homework done. Um, I think that, that the teachers are very worried about putting one more stress on a lot of our students while they're going through a very difficult time in their own lives. Yeah, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about uh, the difficulties that you're hearing teachers saying that they're having to actually work harder now uh, 
How is that management with the teachers and managing the classes that they have now? Because um, I imagine it's got to take a lot more effort to reach out to maybe some of the students who aren't checking in, who aren't uh, you know, participating as much because they're not physically there to see them. What does that process look like with teachers that are remote, you know, practicing this remote teaching and having to check in with all of their students? Well, our teachers are doing a great job. Um, they have been calling individual students to see how they're doing and trying to reach out to make sure that everyone's okay, see what they need. Um, they're doing the best they can to provide both. And so for teachers, they may have to do double the work. They may have to prepare an online lesson and a packet, okay? And I think that a lot of parents that are staying home with kids understand there's more to learning than just saying, here's a worksheet, because how do you understand it? How do you take down you know, complicated, steps and, uh, complicated uh, steps and make it easier to understand? And what a lot of our teachers are saying is you can't just give a kid a book and say, learn. If that was the case, we wouldn't need teachers. Um, and so a lot of our teachers are trying to do the best they can. But like I said, they're having to do uh, duplicated work and trying to provide that. and reaching out to their students to see if they can engage them as well. You know, presumably this pandemic is going to be going on for some time. The coronavirus, as experts have told us, is here to stay. Uh, until we get a vaccine, this is going to be, you know, this we're sort of adjusting to this new normal. Um, if we look at the fall and we think about how this is going to proceed, what do you think is the best best mechanism to make sure that kids are actually going to be able to learn if we have to step back from being in schools the way we're, the way we're used to them? So the, the easiest answer in this case is we do not know yet. Um, I think one of the benefits that we have right now is that, I don't want to be clear about this, people have been saying schools are closed, schools are not closed. Our students and our teachers are still working, learning is still going on. The physical buildings are closed. So by closing the physical buildings until the end of the school year and having the summer in between is gonna give us some time to look at, see what's happening in our state with this virus. Um, and then to think about, okay, where are we at and how do we then proceed? And I know there are been some suggestions that we need to maintain social distancing at our schools. I think there's a lot of parents, though, that if we want to try to open up our economy, are looking to see, you know, how to, where is my child during the day? Um, and so they want to make sure that, you know, they can go to school. And that's going to be helpful to open our economy. But I know that a lot of teachers are also deeply concerned. You know, we have teachers that have underlying health conditions themselves. They may live with a, you know, a family member that has, you know, are elderly or have health conditions and they don't want to be a, you know, carrier. Um, so there are things that can potentially happen. It may be, you know, potentially online. There may be social distancing at the school. I think that's going to depend on using this time that we have now and hopefully as an entire community, trying to make sure that we are careful about making sure that we get down the amount of people that are infected. Um, so that this does not become a second, you know, incident where everything blows up again and we have to shut down completely all over again. You know, we uh, are, are seeing some comments coming in and people obviously have a lot of opinions on, on how schools should manage. What is the uh, HSCA doing maybe to communicate with teachers to kind of get maybe their comments, their insights? Because I imagine there's a lot of teachers who are um, sharing their ideas, their thoughts with, you know, the union and trying to see what best practices to move forward. Uh, what are some of the things that you folks are doing to maybe make sure that those comments are being heard and, and being delivered to those that need to hear it? Well, the first thing is this. We cannot open schools if we do not have teachers. Um, you know, and we were hearing the governor talking about a 20%, you know, decrease for teacher pay. I think he said he wants to look now to see if he can get all their alternatives. I would say that that's a big concern we have. Hawaii already has a shortage of a thousand teachers in the state. And if we were to dramatically cut teacher salaries, I don't know if we could open the schools. We wouldn't have enough teachers. A lot of our veteran teachers potentially would retire. A brand new teacher. So an unlicensed teacher in Hawaii right now makes about $36,000 a year. A 20% pay cut 
that teacher would make $29,000 a year. No one can afford to live on that as a teacher. And I'm not sure that we would have enough teachers to open our classrooms. So if you ask right now, I would love to be able to just focus on those things. When that news came up just recently, that took a lot of our attention away. Um, and that's sort of what we're trying to make sure that we focus on. At the same time, supporting a lot of our teachers. There's a lot of changes going on. How do we handle graduation? How do we handle final grades? What do we do with seniors that are not graduating? Um, how do we handle teacher evaluations? I mean, everything's being done new. And I, I can tell you, our teachers are stressed. They're stressed. I mean, they're trying to do the best that they can. And it feels like every day there's a new thing happening where all of a sudden they have to adjust to. So HSDA has been working closely with the DOE. We've been having constant communication with them. We've been trying to have regular communication with our members so that as best as we can, that if we can work with the department to get out information to our, uh, our teachers, then there's less stress on them as well. I don't Sorry. think that's me. I don't know who that is. <laughs> I don't know that's the reality of being at home, right? Um, I want to I just go back to the days of the teacher, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you about uh, something that you just mentioned, which are those high school seniors who may not have the uh, requirements to actually graduate this year. What is your concern for them? I know that there's been some talk about worrying that, that the kids would essentially drop out. Uh, what is your concern for those folks? So we've been asking our teachers to try to work with the seniors to be able to give them um, the ability to graduate. But one of the things that is, I taught seniors for years. And, you know, even in the best circumstances, sadly, some people just don't come to school or don't do their work. And that's one of the things, you know, we have to focus on too, is that there's less likely to be participation right now. And so if there are seniors that, potentially we're not passing in the third quarter. Uh, teachers are trying to work with them and giving them an opportunity to pass. Now, whether they're going to actually do the work is something else. So there's trying to give credit recovery options as well um, to give as many opportunities for seniors to find this. Our teachers across the state are also working with students potentially that were failing in the third quarter and giving them opportunities. Um, but one of the things that we have to be cognizant of and people assume this, and I know it's not true, not all of our teachers have computers and internet at home. And so it's not been easy for them to connect. I've had teachers that have to drive to the parking lot of their school just to be able to connect to the Wi-Fi and sitting in the parking lot trying to do their work. So, you know, we're all trying to be patient during this uh, uh, incident here to make sure that we can provide uh, enrichment activities. But I'll tell you, it's not as simple sometimes as people think. What is the best way that we as a community can help to support these teachers? I mean, the situation that you're describing is just hard to imagine trying to take care of up to 40 kids in a classroom. And then you yourself, as you mentioned, may not have the resources. Maybe you don't have high speed Internet at home, having to do the packet and the online component. I mean, it just sounds like so much. So what can we do to help? You know, We've had amazing support during this. In fact, it's amazing to see the community coming together uh, during this. Um, and I was you know, really appreciative that when the governor did propose those cuts, the amount of support we saw from the community, from legislators, from you know, parents, and everyone's just saying that the last thing they want is for potentially to lose their teachers. Um, and I think everyone's been really good about working patiently um, with their teachers to try to work with this one. And there have been times where we've heard from a parent, oh, uh, maybe my child's not getting this one. And we said, contact the teacher, work with them. And they have been. So I, I really like to say thank you to all of the parents out there, all the students out there that are really trying to make the best of a very uh, hard situation. I want to know also what is it going to take for teachers for to feel comfortable to get back touching on something that you said earlier, given how overcrowded a lot of Hawaii schools are. Do you foresee, you know, half days or uh, or alternate days, you know, students A through K last name go one day and then L through Z go the other day. I mean, what do, what kind of strategies are you looking at? Because we need some kind of school this fall. So. 
I think what this crisis has shown too is some of the underlying problems we've had in our schools for such a long period of time that now all of a sudden it comes to a certain point and it just exposes how difficult it would be. And I'll point this out. So what happens when you have a lack of a teachers? Well, if you have lack of teachers, you have to grow class sizes. So we have teachers that have complained for years about how many students they have in a class. I've had 40 students in a class. So even if, so let's, some people have talked about doing alternating days where only half of the students would come in on a certain day. Even if I had say half of my students, 20 students in that classroom, I'm still concerned they wouldn't be able to do social distancing. So we have to be able to find a way potentially to do social distancing at the school. Um, there are ideas of that one. There may be modified schedules. There may be dealing with the situation of spreading out the kids, but then the next concern is how do you deal with those parents? Because again, if you have to have your child, if you have to go to work and you have to leave your child at school, what are you gonna do if it's every other day? So we have to look at other social programs to be able to help those parents that do not have that care to be able to help them as well. Well, we know that you are a busy man and we really appreciate you taking the time uh, to spend with us and to kind of give us insights and, and a view of what teachers are going through. Uh, so. Corey Wesley, we thank you so much, HSCA President, for joining us. Uh, any final thoughts that you may have uh, here on the show? No, again, just thank you to everyone during this whole crisis. Uh, I want you to know that the teachers of Hawaii are here for everyone. Um, we want to help you with this, this crisis and be able to help your kids go through this very difficult time. And we just appreciate all the help that we've been getting as well. Okay, well, thank great. you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to check in maybe in a few weeks and uh, get maybe a, an update and see what things are like because uh, this thing is changing every day. So uh, we hope that you stay well and uh, give our best to all the teachers. We really appreciate all the work that you and all of the teachers do for our students here in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. You know, Ryan, I thought he had a really good point there. We say that school is closed, but school is not closed. The physical buildings are closed, but those teachers, from what he's describing, uh, working harder than ever to try to make sure that their students do not fall behind. Um, and the real challenge of technology, when we think about teachers themselves not having the tools that they need um, to try to reach students who also don't have those tools, and what does this look like? You know, that alternate day idea is something that could be appealing to some or doing, you know, half the alphabet one day and whatnot. But uh, he's right. How are we going to get parents back to work if we can only send our school children to school every other day? Yeah. And then also the dynamics of that's what's happening in the classroom. But how do you manage social distancing beyond the classroom after school, during recesses, during lunch? I think there's a lot of questions that state officials are still having to tackle as we sort of figure out how to you know roll out roll things out and and we're beginning to see more and more businesses open up no doubt uh they're continuing to look at ways to see how the state can continue to move forward while also managing social distancing in places like classrooms we appreciate all your comments today and thank you for submitting questions we know that there are so many questions around this and you know uh corey rosenley was very honest he said you know in a lot of these qu questions cases we just don't know so we will continue that conversation with him we want this to be an open channel of communication so we will invite him back in a few weeks to get an update we also want to talk about a few other headlines today uh scott murakami was on on tuesday and he talked about standing up that uh PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program website. Good news, it's up and running. Now, this is different from regular unemployment benefits. Just as a refresher, uh, the ULI program is something that employers pay, pay into. It's basically an insurance program. So that is for people with a traditional W-2. This is something that is entirely different. This is for self-employed, uh, self independent contractors, gig economy workers, and freelancers. Uh, it is a way for them to access the federal benefits. They can't access state benefits because they haven't paid into that insurance program, but there are federal monies that are available. And so we invite you to go to pua.hawaii.gov and fill out one of those applications. Um, it's a basically a two-week time frame now to figure out who's qualified and then hopefully start to get payments out to those folks. Our understanding is that it's up to $600 a week from the federal government. Yeah, and important to know that this is sort of just the onboarding process, that the actual claim and the filing uh, is not going to be happening for a few more weeks. This is sort of just to kind of put your name in there. Uh, find out, one, if you qualify for this level of, of this unemployment benefit. Uh, and it's also important to note that many people have already submitted that claim 
through the old system, uh, the state and the unemployment office is saying that uh, you wouldn't need to go through this new uh, pool website in order to uh, sort of transfer over because of the fact that these, like we said, these 1099 contracted workers are sort of in a different category. And that's why they're having to stand up this separate landing page. But uh, again, make sure that you get in line and get going there. Uh, I think we also want to uh, make mention that we will have Director Moore coming back here on next week, Tuesday, to answer hopefully more questions because we know that there are still a lot of questions out there about uh, the unemployment benefits and the system that's currently taking place. And I see a comment here from Tony Gomes who says that the website works. He used it yesterday, so we like to hear that. I know there was a lot of concern that this website would also be overwhelmed with uh, applicants. So we'll be asking Director Murakami for an update there. Um, interesting to note that the Blood Bank of Hawaii is collecting plasma for COVID-19 treatments. This is part of a national trial that's going on. They want to see if taking plasma from people who have recovered from the virus and giving it to people who are battling the virus will help them to overcome the disease. So that's something the Blood Bank of Hawaii is participating in, and you can read more about that in today's Honolulu Star Advertiser, a really interesting article about potential treatments using the blood from one patient or the plasma from one patient to aid someone else. That's right. And, and another big question is uh, the, the uh, excuse me, uh, you know, the, there is talks about RIMPAC that's happening, and we just got word that RIMPAC will actually be taking place uh, later this summer. Uh, officials saying that they will be confined to the water. There will no, be no interaction. I think that there's still a lot of question marks that people have about this. I know that there was a lot of concerns, more questions that they had for government officials about RIMPAC and its potential impact. Again, countries from all over the world being represented in this yearly training exercise that happens off Hawaii's waters. Uh, but there was a report and uh, uh, official confirmation made yesterday that that would be taking place. And so we'll continue to wait and see what more information we can gather from that. Uh, that I know is a concern for Hawaii residents, especially as we continue to keep our case numbers now. Uh, we always like to highlight a Hawaii hero of the day. So Oahu families in need, there's going to be several large distributions by the Hawaii Food Bank. The first will take place today from noon to four at YPO Soccer Complex. That's a map there uh, of where this is all taking place. And you can see at the bottom the organizations that are helping to hold this up. Of course, the city and county of Honolulu, the uh, Bank of Hawaii, which has donated generously to the Hawaii Resilience Fund, and Hawaii Food Bank, but the real community partner here that we want to highlight also is the Hawaii Community Foundation. Um, they are doing a lot to make sure that food gets to families in need, so we really uh, want to mahalo them for all of their hard work. In terms of the actual pickup today, they're encouraging vehicles to pick up for two to three families to keep the line down. They will be asking you some questions when you are in the line. That information is confidential. They, it's just for informational purposes. They want to find out, um, you know, your job status and how you've been affected by COVID. But please be assured that you will. That information is confidential. It's really just for them to get a handle on who's getting the food and uh, and where it's going. And we're seeing more of it in man more now more than ever, of course, of the Hawaii Food Bank. And so they are going to be looking to doing more of these drives on a regular basis because they realize that people are having difficulty just putting food on the table. So uh, the Hawaii Food Bank now you know, always an important organization in our community now more than ever. Uh, so if you actually have the means to donate and support the Hawaii Food Bank, we highly encourage you to do that because they're going to need a lot of support to help to provide those meals. But we certainly want to highlight these partners who are going to be involved in this uh, very big giving and, and donation drive that's going to be happening this afternoon. Yeah, and if you don't live in that area or you want to find out about the next one, you can go to hawaiifoodbank.org for dates and times of the next large-scale drop-off. Um, we always remind you, fill out the census. It's very important to do that. So if you have a little time, do that. Participate in the contact tracing surveys that we have talked about, about here. Uh, Aloha Trace and Hawaii Fights COVID. Those are two ways that you can do your part. Hawaii Fights COVID, it's a 10 minute survey. You fill it out once unless your health status changes. Aloha Trace, it's something that you do every day. It takes two minutes. Check them out online. They're very important uh, surveys for us all to take. That's right. And again, we're looking forward to uh, another ex a great show tomorrow. We're going to hear a little bit more about the numbers focusing in specifically on how Hawaii has maintained this pandemic and maybe some other scenarios of what things could have looked like uh, should, you know, or could look like potentially with the second wave, but really going through and digging through some of those numbers.
Yeah, Nick Redding from the Hawaii Data Collaborative is going to be joining us. Um, and it's really interesting. I had a chance to talk with him a little bit yesterday. He's going to be presenting some numbers on the flattening of the curve. And like Ryan said, what could have been, what still could be. Um, so that's really interesting to dig deep into the numbers. And the other side of this pandemic, which of course is the economic side, he's going to be showing us some numbers about how many people uh, have lost their jobs and what that means in terms of their financial security and what that means for the state more broadly. So please join us for that tomorrow. I think that'll be very interesting for folks to see. And again, next week, Monday, we'll be back with Governor David Ige, Tuesday, Director Murakami, and uh, we'll also have Lieutenant Governor Josh Green joining us next week. So another full week ahead. Uh, but until then, until tomorrow, we want to thank all of you once again for tuning in to the COVID-19 Care Conversation. Again, thank you and mahalo to our sponsors, the Hawaii Executive Collaborative, for making this conversation possible. And again, we encourage all of you to head over to the Honolulu Star Advertisers uh, website for resources and more information to stay engaged with this COVID-19 pandemic. So until then, we'll see you tomorrow. Aloha. Stay safe, everyone. Aloha.